Hello everyone. Thank you for attending my session. Today I'll talk to you about building resilient services in Clojure. My name is Morjo and I've been working as a software engineer in the backend team at a company called Hellshift for the last five years. I've been building services using Clojure, which scale up to thousands of requests per second. This talk is a summary of the patterns that we have seen in production that has helped us build more resilient systems using Clojure. In physics, a system is said to be in a state of equilibrium if the net force acting on the system is zero. Both these systems are in a state of equilibrium here. But if there's a force that acts on these systems, the first system topples over, but the second does not. The tendency of the system in the second image is naturally to fall back to its original state of operation. In our journey of building systems and services, we should aspire to having stable equilibrium where even if there is an anomaly, it does not impact the system severely. In software engineering, resiliency is said to be the ability of the system to gracefully handle and recover from failures. The goal is not to prevent failures from happening completely because that is not possible, but it is to build enough mechanisms inside our systems so that we are able to handle failures gracefully and recover from them as soon as possible. When we build a service, the first thing we implement is the business logic. This business logic is the reason for this system to exist in the first place. Here we have a function that takes the username, converts the username of that user into a profile ID and fetches the profile statistics of that user. When the end user requests their statistics, the call comes to this service and this function ultimately makes a call to a database and the data is fetched from there. So the user is indirectly dependent on this database. So if something happens to the database, then it impacts the way the user uses the service. If something happens to the database and the, and the call to the database does not go through, the user might see something like this, where a public safety notification was sent to the user's device. And upon clicking on the notification, they're shown something like an Nginx 504 timeout error. This is completely unrelated to the public safety alert that the user wanted to know more about. This kind of break of user experience is what we hope to prevent with resilient systems. Having implemented the business logic, our story about resilience will look like a two-part journey. First, we'll look at a user-centric approach to resilience where we focus on failure handling. And in the second part of the journey, we will look at how to engineer our systems in such a way that failures happen as rarely as possible. In user-centric resilience, the goal is to think from the user's point of view and understand that there will be failures within our system. The design should incorporate this possibility of failures as first principles in order to provide a seamless experience to the user despite having failures. The first step to building a resilient service is to, be is to be cognizant of the possibility that a piece of code can fail. Exception handling is acknowledging this possibility that our piece of code can fail. As you can see here, upon catching this fictional driver exception, we are returning a status code to our client application. The client application can handle this by displaying something helpful to the user, such as please try again later. However, it is not always ideal to send an error status to our clients. A better approach is to have a fallback implementation. If our call to our database does not go through, as you can see on the right, the web service is able to return a reasonable response to the, to the user. This is in spite of not being able to talk to the database. So in this code, whenever the call to the database succeeds, we save the response from the database to a local cache. This local cache can be something like a closure core cache or something as simple as an atom in which we store the last known value we got from the database. In case the call to the database fails after this cache has been populated, the cache result can be returned to the user, which while not making the most uh, recent update or the most perfect response for the user, it is still better than asking the user to try again later. Fallbacks, uh, fallbacks help in uh, being graceful to the user when systems we depend on are degraded. 
but it only works if the failure sur surfaces to the web service at all. What might also happen is that the call to the database doesn't actually fail, but it takes a very long time to return. In that case, we don't want our users to wait a very long time uh, before getting a response. Instead of waiting for exceptions to happen, we can add a timeout uh, around our uh, block of code, which is executing. Some databases or connection parameters like connection timeouts or socket timeouts can provide this by default, but that let us look at how to do this purely in closure. In this code block here, we are running the code not in the calling thread, but as a future. Doing this allows us to use deref on the future and provide a timeout value, which signifies how long the calling thread will wait for the future to complete. The timeout here is 5,000 milliseconds or five seconds. If this does not complete by that time, a default value is used. In this code, the default value is the cache result, which you saw before. Instead of thinking of failures as a permanent or terminal event, we should also think about the transient nature of some failures. Meaning that some failures may only occur for a very short duration and automatically recover. This is like a momentary glitch on the de dependent system. Therefore, before deciding to use the fallback implementation, which is not the most correct response for the user anyway, we might want to try uh, some of these operations again. Here, the first three queries to the database, database fails, but it succeed on the, succeeds on the fourth try, and the user get the, gets the most up-to-date response. At the bottom here, we are wrapping our profile stats from DB function with a macro call with retries. This macro takes a failure predicate that returns true if the exception is retriable. This small example underscores the expressivity that Clojure provides with the help of passing functions as first class arguments and makes the code base very modular and readable. At this point, we have not seen the code for the weight retries macro, but we are able to understand what this is signifying and what it is trying to do. The macro itself takes a failure predicate as the first argument and some forms. We execute these forms inside a loop recur where we rerun the forms if the exception that satisfies the retry predicate fails for more fails for five times or, or we throw the exception back to the caller if the failure happens for uh, the sixth time uh, after all the retries have been exhausted. Retries can be configured to be more versatile as well. In this example, we are extending the with retries macro to accept a map of options that include a backup sequence now. Given the number of retry being performed, this backup sequence function decides how retries are going to be spaced out, which might help the degraded service to recover. Again, this highlights the ease with which a fairly complicated pattern can be concisely expressed with closures list syntax and functional nature. Retries, however, cause the user's uh, request to take more time to be responded to. If the failure is not transient and the database does not recover for a longer period of time, then every request from the uh, user uh, waits while these retries are being attempted. Instead of just relying on retries, a better approach is to take a cue from the failures that we have already seen and retry only if there is a reasonable chance of uh, success. This brings us to the circuit breakers pattern. We look at the history of failures that happened and based on a strategy, we considered the database to be in a degraded state for some time in the future. During this time, we do not make any request to the database and simply consider the database to be non-functional. We call this opening of the circuit or breaking of the circuit. After a configured amount of time has passed, we try sending requests to the database and the cycle repeats until, this, until the, health, the health of the database improves. In this example, the strategy for circuit breaking is based on the last failure that happened after the retries were exhausted. As you can see in the diagram, we first retry a request five times and then open the circuit for a while. And during this time, we rely on some fallback implementation instead of actually calling the database. We can do this in code by recording the time every time a failure happens, as you can see in the catch clause here. In the happy path of the code, before making a call to the database, we check if the time since the last failure has exceeded 
the configure threshold or not. If it has not, then we throw the exception indicating that the circuit is broken. A crucial part of the circuit breaker implementation is the strategy based on which the circuit is opened. As we, see, as we saw in the previous example, we considered the time of the last failure plus a buffer as a strategy for the circuit to remain open. We can also choose something that is more powerful like a threshold on the number of failures or the percentage of failures that happened in the last W seconds. We can also include something like the number of slow queries that has happened in the last W seconds. However, all three strategies that are listed here are reactive strategies. We are waiting for failures to happen or operations to become significantly slow before we can take the action of opening the circuit. An alternative would be a health check mechanism such as like a ping mechanism that is provided to us by the service we are using. The user facing service can then periodically refresh the health of the system it depends on. If we know beforehand that, that the database is not healthy, we can directly resort to the fallback implementation without waiting for failures or timeouts to happen. So far, we have looked at how to shield the user from failures in our system. Now let us look at how to engineer our systems in such a way that failures are, failures are less likely to originate in our services in the first place. It is important to realize that our code will be running on hardware. We need to know the system requirements and configure our system so that the, nece so that the necessary resources are available for it to run effectively, which would otherwise cause failures due to something like resource starvation. In closure services, this would mean uh, choosing the correct heap settings, tuning the garbage collection parameters, and other JVM uh, options that may be available. This would also help us uh, choose the correct machine instance. For example, if it runs on Amazon Web Services, this would mean choosing the instance type and the number of instances, which satisfies our requirement at the best cost. Usage patterns and uh, code changes can cause our system configurations to become obsolete or insufficient over time. Therefore, we need a way of discovering the real-time status of our running systems. And, and, the, and therefore, update our uh, system configuration as required. This can be done by having a monitoring pipeline like Prometheus or Grafana. And uh, having this would allow us to publish and display our uh, real-time status of our systems. We can even have closure-specific instrumentation like rings request response rate or something specific to the business logic. Uh, for example, how, how often do our systems rely on fallback implementations because of the failure to query a database? Instrumentation like this will help us understand if our system requirements have changed and thus whether it warrants uh, a need for re-evaluating the system configuration that we had set up previously. Having configured our system, we need to share the allocated resources across our application, keeping in mind that the resources that we have are finite and our components inside our service should respect this finiteness so that the system never is ask, asking for more resources than what is available. Here is a counter example where we are spawning too many, too many features which take a long time to finish. If we run this piece of code, it is likely that our system will crash. It is because closure features use an unbounded pool of threads and closure threads are mapped to system level kernel threads. Once the number of threads in our operating system is too many, it is likely that the whole machine will crash and not just the process. While this is a toy example, it is not very far from the truth. Say there is an incoming uh, surge on the requests that are made to the service. This can cause the number of threads in the JVM to spike or cause it to crash even. A good way to prevent this from happening is to divide the system into a bounded uh, set of resource pools, each of which has a, is dedicated for a particular component in the system. Here we have four different thread pools, each of which is configured with an upper bound on the number of threads. We have a database pool, an HTTP connection pool, a pool for background tasks, and a pool, for pool of threads that are accepting requests from the user. 
by dividing the system into a composition of resource pools you might realize that some of the pools depend on each other for example a closure future pool may be used by the request processing pool for doing some background tasks we therefore arrive at a dependency graph of resource pools if there is a resource starvation or resource contention in one of these pools the rest of the system is not going to be affected this is known as the bulkhead pattern here resource pool 3 and 6 are unable to serve their workload that is expected out of, out of it this could be due to a change in the usage pattern for example if there are spam requests of a certain type but this effect is localized to these two pools only and the rest of the system can continue to function because the system resources given to each component is bounded and thus the impact does not spread through the system so far we have been looking at just our system in isolation however in reality we would have a request flow through multiple services for the user to get the final response here we see users making a request to the web service the web service making a few requests to internal services and ultimately we query a database between each of these stages in the pipeline there is a queue that holds requests that are waiting for service imagine now there is a surge in demand from the users of this service for example the app that we are building suddenly becomes very popular this would cause the number of requests of the web service to shoot up this causes the outgoing requests from the web service to also increase causing an increased load in the rest of the system which is internal and can you know also include something like a database we can see here that the load cascades from one service to the other without any hindrance this affects all the all the services which come along the way and their health is also affected if something like this happens to the core services like a database it would be a catastrophic failure which would be very hard to recover from what we would rather prefer is a balancing force from the opposite side to negate out the load that is building up restoring the state of equilibrium in our system we can do this by refusing to serve requests once we detect that the load in our system has increased increased to a critical threshold the question now is when do we take the take the action to shed load the response time of a request is the sum of the time a request spends in the queue plus the time it takes to serve that request in real life like a billing counter we can often estimate how loaded the billing counter is by looking at the length of the queue similarly we can estimate how loaded our system is by by seeing how long requests have to wait in the queue for for getting service from a server if the queuing time is too large we can conclude that the system as a whole is overloaded we can implement this logic of load shedding as a ring middleware in closure which wraps over the business logic of our application the load shedding middleware's role is to detect load and drop requests when uh, when they have been delayed due to queuing this has a twofold benefit firstly by dropping already delayed requests we do not make new requests wait too long and secondly we do not let incoming load flow over to the internal services because we are dropping extra requests that are too much for the system to handle the actual detection of the load is done uh, by looking inside the request map for a timestamp at which the request was ingested into the system this can be done this timestamp can be recorded by something like jetty which is the server container that is used in this example a related concept to load shedding is rate limiting where we limit the rate at which incoming requests can be made to our system however load shedding is more versatile and dynamic in the sense that we are able to take feedback from the system in real time before dropping load let us consider two scenarios first let us consider a surge in incoming load as the, as shown in the diagram here uh, suddenly there is a let let us imagine that suddenly there is a number of users which are making requests to the system at the same time this could be too much for a system to handle both uh, both load shedding and rate limiting can prevent this uh, new set of requests from cascading into internal systems now let us consider the second scenario where the load uh, incoming into the system is same 
but due to the health of the database being degraded due to some other reason, it is taking more, more time to serve requests. This would cause a buildup of load in the system, like you might observe a large queue of pending requests. This scenario would not be solved by limiting the rate of incoming requests to the web service. With load shedding though, our middleware would detect this queuing and drop requests, even though the rate of incoming requests remains the same. So far, we have looked at a, quite a few patterns ranging from user-centric approaches to system-centric approaches. But where do we go from here? An open-ended question is, what is the next resilience pattern that we need to implement into our systems? Resilience engineering is a constant uphill battle fighting to prevent new failures from happening in production. An important way of keeping resilience patterns up to date is by learning from production incidents. Our incident analysis needs to feed back into our engineering processes in order for the whole team to learn about the next resilience pattern that we need to implement. This learning can be codified in the form of focus teams for incident analysis, repositories with resilience patterns, and handbooks for architecting services so as to ensure that all future services we write are taking resilience as the first principle in their design. In this way, the, uh, the process of uh, feedback from incident analysis can help in converting incidental knowledge into a team-wide acumen for broad spectrum uh, resilient system design. Incident analysis and feedback is crucial for an engineering team to grow. But how do we know that the preventive mechanisms we are putting in place are going to work? Incidents happen rarely and even more rarely in this exact same manner. So then we need a mechanism to prove that the patterns that we are using are going to work and that we are not overfitting the solution in the sense that it only works for a very, very specific kind of failure. Also incidents are, uh, incidents should not be the only way we learn about our system's failure patterns. Resilience patterns are here to prevent incidents from happening in the first place. To say that we will wait for incidents to make our system more resilient is somewhat of an oxymoron. Chaos engineering is a practice where we ingest failures deliberately into a fraction of our workload in order to get confirmation on the resilience mechanisms we have put into place, and more importantly, to learn about new failure patterns. This is a change in mindset going from a firefighting based resilience into a scientific and experimentation based resilience engineering. As the scale of our product grows, there'll be newer ways the system will start failing. And if we have to rely on incidents to learn about these failures, it might be too late or start affecting the reputation of our product. Once we have chaos engineering in place, it would give us the opportunity to discover new failure patterns faster and reiterate on the system design before flaws start impacting our users on a larger scale through incidents. While it is necessary to think about resilience as part of system design, it, is, it also gives rise to making in innovative and forward thinking engineering choices. Tokyo is a real world example in this regard. Being in one of the world's most earthquake prone zones, it has not, top, it has not stopped uh, Tokyo's development. In fact, they've gone far and beyond and implemented remarkable ways of constructing buildings that are safe and earthquake proof. But this has not happened overnight. It was a constant and persistent effort over decades that has made Tokyo's magnificent, magnificent skyline become resistant to earthquakes. So thank you for attending this session. If you find what I talked about interesting, please do get in touch with me. I would, learn to, I would love to learn about how other engineering teams are building resilient services. My Twitter handle is on the slide here. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them in the Q&A section. Here are a few of the references that I used during the talk. Thanks again.